Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jafar Ahmed with SCSP. Also, first off, I just want to say thanks to Dr. Hicks for some wonderful remarks. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce our next group of esteemed speakers. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Craig Martell, Chief Data, Off Chief Data and AI Officer at DOD, Aki Jain, Global CTO and President of US Government Business for Palantir, Chris Lynch, CEO of Rebellion, Rebellion Defense and former founding director at, of Defense Digital Service, and General Terrence O'Shaughnessy, Vice President at Space, SpaceX and former commander of the United States Northern Command. They will be joined on stage by Dr. DJ Patel, general partner in Great Point Ventures and a longstanding innovation leader for a conversation on new tech solutions to national security challenges. Dr. Patel, over to you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, this is uh, going to be a lot of fun on a number of dimensions. But maybe before I start, because we, but we're, we're all brought together here by, uh, with the common thread of uh, Secretary Carter. I think one of the ways I'll just share is actually how I got connected to Secretary Carter is actually through Stephanie. And one of the things I think that people often miss is the superpower of, of Stephanie. And I, I met her at South by Southwest just after we'd come up with this term called data scientist to describe this way of this new thing that's now become majors and doctorate degrees. And uh, she said, you should really meet my husband. And I said, well, okay, well, wh where is he? He said, I think he's landing on an aircraft carrier in the South Pacific. Might, might have been one of your boats. <laughs> uh, and, and fast forward a number of years later, when I was going into, uh, into the, the Obama administration, President Obama had one explicit order for me. He said, you cannot work on national security. Uh, to which then I ran into Stephanie while walking their dog with, with Ash, and she said, you have to help Ash. And we did a number of clandestine things without President Obama knowing where we were working together on getting Silicon Valley and the Department of Defense more connected. And then uh, after that, we had an exception to the rule that uh, Secretary Carter had crafted with the president, President Obama, to allow me to do that work. And so uh, one of the things I don't think that is often mentioned enough is how Stephanie has been the glue for so many people to actually get connected and brought in to Team Carter to work on these problems. So thank you, Stephanie, for all the work that you've done. Uh, so, uh, and, and because of this panel is focused on innovation, uh, we have a number of great panelists that I'll go through in a second, uh, uh, but I need my glasses these days. <laughs> uh, so we have Aki Jane, who is CTO of Palantir. Uh, Palantir just celebrated their 20 year anniversary uh, just a couple days ago, and Aki's been there for the majority of, of the journey. We have Chris Lynch, who is CEO of Rebellion Defense and was the uh, first person to really help get the Defense Digital Service started, uh, uh, led uh, under the initiative by Ash. And we have Craig Martell, who is the uh, Chief Digital and AI Officer at the DOD. And he's also been had a number of wide array areas that make him super well qualified for this, not only being a former professor at the Naval Postgraduate School, but also heading up AI data efforts at LinkedIn, all of the AI machine learning efforts at Dropbox, as well as Lyft. And we have General O'Shaughnessy, uh, Vice President of SpaceX, but also former commander of Northern Command and Nor NORAD. Uh, so we have a tremendous amount of expertise, but unlike some organizations, I also have to give a number of disclosures. Uh, I worked at LinkedIn. Uh, where uh, uh, Craig also worked. I'm uh, one of the first investors in uh, Rebellion Defense, and then also uh, was an advisor early on to Palantir. So <laughs> I, I, regret, I regret not <laughs> investing in <laughs> SpaceX. <laughs> Some decisions you wish you had back. Uh, but with those disclosures, Craig, I want to start with you. You've just com completed a year uh, in this months. Almost a year. Almost a year. Yeah. Okay. So, but who's counting days? <laughs> but you're all, uh, you, you came from the private sector. You're coming into this role. What has been your biggest learning 
uh, as you've come into the Department of Defense, especially at this time where uh, suddenly every place you go in the department, everyone must be talking about AI? So uh, two or three. Uh, the first one is, so my role is not just AI, right? It's Chief Digital and AI Officer, so it's data, analytics, and AI. And I think the first thing I was surprised by was I, I thought my job was going to be to convince people that they needed to be data-driven. And uh, the, the people here had already done that. Um, there, was, there was strong, when I arrived, there was already really strong demand for, uh, to be data-driven, and there was really just a, the, the goal of how to be data-driven. So that was the first thing. The, the second thing is <clears throat> what that really means. You know, uh, at the, in the last panel uh, before Dr. Hicks, somebody said you should buy what you, really, you say that you want. You should buy AI, but only 1% of the department's buying AI. Well, that's because people don't actually want AI is, my, is the thing that I learned. They say they want AI, and there are some cases where they really want AI. But, um, Re what they, if you listen to the demand, it's really a demand for clean data and a good dashboard to let you know where things are and how you can uh, interact with the things uh, either that you need to operate with or even just you know, things you need to count or where your dollars are. So um, they don't really want to, they want to be data driven. They kind of want to skip the step of getting the data right in order to be data driven. And, and finally, the third thing I learned um, which DJ, you and I have talked about a lot, it's really missing a layer of product management. Um, the department knows things that it wants, it knows capabilities that it wants, but it often spends a lot of time looking very close to the boat. And I get that, that's really important. The fight tonight really matters. And so I've been trying really hard to figure out how to balance the fight tonight with getting it, getting it right in the long run. Uh, the way I'd like to say this is, for any of you who are in the government, imagine some government system that you've used that, I don't know, frustrated you because it didn't quite work the way it was supposed to work. Anybody relate to that? Um, imagine you could call the developer of that system five years ago and say, could you just make these two tweaks? Just do this and this, and then my life would be so much better. We would all make that call. So I, 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 the, the, the thing that's been hard for me to figure out up till now is, how do I balance the fight tonight with taking that call from five years from now to see if we can also make it sustainable in the long run? Do people actually get this problem at the DOD? Uh, the product management problem? The, the product management problem as well <laughs> as this. You're coming in from a space where you, know, you talk about these terms and these ideas and people kind of know automatically what this means. There, there's a linguistic component to this. Well, you can't say PM, right? Because PM means right. program manager or uh, right. some other things. But even when you define that, do people get these things? And even understanding like, hey, the foundation of this is basic clean data. Oh, I think they do once you start to explain it. Like that little spiel that I just gave gets, is getting more and more head nods. So I think it's pretty consistent. Um, so the clean data part, I think, Okay, sorry, you, you sent me on a rabbit hole, your fault. But um, I'm the, here all day. The, <laughs> the demand for AI is, is, there's some real demand for valid AI and the centers of excellence are amazing and I'm super impressed with what we're doing, for sure. And then there's a demand for AI, which is really just clean data. But there's also this other demand for AI, which is really give me some pixie dust so I don't have to hire as many people. And um, that part is, it, the, the first part, clean data or AI doesn't work, uh, that's easy to explain. The, there's no pixie dust is really hard because <clears throat> industry, um, no, no, no offense, uh, <laughs> love, loves to sell pixie dust. And so striking that balance between, not you guys, present company <laughs> accepted. I knew, what, I knew what you meant. <laughs> uh, um, so, so, they don't get that part. They actually think AI is going to come save them uh, tons of billets. And when I let them know that AI is actually going to cost you billets and is going to be more expensive, you're just going to be more efficient at the things that matter. Uh, the capabilities you want will get there better, faster, stronger. But you need a bunch of other people to do that. That I think that's a surprise. Mm -hmm. 
General, I'd, lo I'd love to go to you next. Uh, with SpaceX, you've really captured the the, capture something special in the American public. The number of people who t have tuned in to watch the launch, uh, people who are always seeing these video snippets of the reusable systems, Starlink, all the things about that. You've also been on both sides of this. What, what is it that you have learned now being in this role, seeing the capabilities, the ideas, the speed at which you move, that you wish you knew when you were in your previous roles in the DoD? Yeah, it's definitely a classic case of I wish I knew then what I know now. Um, in many ways, uh, the commercial innovation that is happening uh, all around us isn't necessarily as well understood within the government and certainly the DoD. And it was really only to the latter part of my career. In fact, working with Aki is one example of Northcom during the COVID crisis, uh, and there's Doug. Doug, uh, Aki and I worked together to try to, we had 16,000 medical personnel deployed, supporting uh, New York City and other areas. And we we're trying to keep track of them, understand what was actually going on. And so between Aki, Doug and I, we were able to use actual commercial technology and apply it to a DOD problem here. And that was a, a, one of my first insights into the power of the commercial innovation. Um, and then now fast forward to where I am today, and watching at SpaceX, we just have these amazing individuals who are innovating at the speed of relevance going into the future. Um, it's super exciting to see what they can do. And the example I'll use uh, today uh, is just what, how do they imagine what's in the realm of the possible? Starlink, as we sit today, has 4,000 satellites on orbit, serving 1.5 million people. Yet, at the same time, our government is asking to build a proliferated LEO constellation, which sounds a lot like Starlink in many ways, but a government application of that, yet they're looking for a couple hundred satellites on orbit. And so it's imagining what is in the realm of the possible. You can scale, you can do it at cost effectiveness, you can do these things, but you have to imagine it and it can't be iterative, right? We have this, we have this uh, kind of mode where we get into an iterative approach and we kind of look, how are we doing it today? Let's just do something that's a little bit better than that. It's safe, low risk. That will not keep our competitive advantage going forward. So I really think we have to turn to the commercial innovation. We have to replicate that on the government side to keep our competitive advantage going forward. Mm -hmm. Let's stay on that thread for a second because it reminds me of a conversation early on at LinkedIn where similarly, you know, somebody had said, well, we'll just build LinkedIn for, for DOD purposes. And then I had them visit LinkedIn and I said, do you really think you can get all these, this amount of people to build something this, this often? And here the same way, you have an order of magnitude difference in the number of satellites. How do you get government, the DOD in particular, to get it? That this is not just, this is not just a little bit of delta. This is mm -hmm. literally orders of magnitude, mm -hmm. both in speed as well as volume. Yeah, that's the problem, right? That's the last panel uh, before the, the Secretary Hicks was talking about, and I think, you know, Will, uh, Doug, um, Stephanie, uh, Raj all brought up that problem of how do you go? Because the requirements tend to be generated by the warfighters driven through the bureaucracy that ends up being a very incremental approach to here is a requirement. The requirement isn't that realm of the possible. It's a very, usually a somewhat prescriptive solution set. And now you have this revolutionary versus incremental solution set and it doesn't fit. You got a square peg in a round hole and it's very hard in the acquisition side of the house to be able to bring that forward with some risk perhaps uh, for that technology. But in many cases with the commercial world, if you can find capability, not COTS, because COTS has its own baggage with it, right? But not just commercial off the shelf, but if you can take that commercial innovation and find a way to apply it so that you have that scale of commercial to the solution going forward, then I think you can actually find a way that you can marry the commercial innovation, the government requirement processes, and find a way that it's affordable, scalable, and ultimately you're gonna deliver combat relevant capability to the warfighters at pertinent timelines that to date we have been struggling to do to maintain our competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. Okay. Chris, uh, you're back in the public uh, uh, building companies uh, out of public service uh, with Rebellion Defense. And you were at this front edge of the defense digital service trying to unlock these technologies, get these things built. Now you're sitting on the other side what are what what has that been like for you, kind of seeing that from the the other side of the window? 
Wow, <clears throat> there's a lot there. Um, a couple different things. You know, when I was in the building, I spent a lot of time thinking about how do we bring in incredible people, right? Product managers, uh, software engineers, designers. Um, how do we bring these people into a place where they are the rare skill set? And how do we pair them with people who know the mission so deeply? And, and out of that, my, the belief was always, and I think that we did, and I think we saw this, I think the, that's the magic that comes out of that kind of a pairing. And during that time, what we focused on were a couple different things. I will, I'll, I'll just call them sort of foundational concepts or technologies that would be sort of everyday things in a normal commercial company. You know, you look at, it, it, you look at the work that um, Ash did with us on, on you know, uh, unveiling Hack the Pentagon, doing bug bounties. These are normal things. Looking at... Do you want to explain just for a second what, what that is? Just to, to, just yeah. to, to so, give people an idea of some of these projects and the challenges. Yeah. So, so we, we had this idea that what if we were to do something that was very, very normal within the commercial, uh, commercial sector? Let's have ethical hackers come in and test the, you know, test the systems that the DoD uses. And let's look for actual vulnerabilities. Now, while that might seem kind of obvious, hey, let's have the best people from all over the world come and do that, it turns out there was this one minor little detail. It was illegal. <laughs> Details uh, that sometimes you have to work through. And so we had to prove that this thing that was called the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which was literally created out of Ronald Reagan watching the movie War Games a very long time ago and saying, hey, we should probably create a law to tell people it's illegal to hack our DOD systems. Uh, we should make sure that we actually open it up so that the best researchers and ethical hackers can assist the mission of defense and make us more secure. So we had this idea. As you might imagine, not everybody loved that idea. And, uh, and I was actually just telling the story uh, a little bit ago where I'll never forget uh, the secretary, myself, Eric Rosenbach, and a number, number of others, we were flying across the country. I believe you were also there. I, I was there. To go to <laughs> announce, yeah, Doug was there as well, to go and announce, hack the Pentagon at RSA, Ted Schlein was gonna be interviewing the secretary. So we're like in a plane, flying across the country, and a lawyer from the Department of Defense is like, this is illegal, you cannot announce this thing, and tried to shut it down as we were doing that. And I think it's a little bit of a testament to Ash, right? Um, just to like bring it back home for a moment because we fought and we won. And that program then got written into law for other federal agencies. It now created the vulnerability disclosure program for the DOD, which is like see something, say something. It opened up how to do this in other governments. It's just, it's pretty remarkable. But I go back to this idea, that's like a foundational thing, right? It's like something that was obvious in another sector, but it was considered off limits within government. And it turns out it wasn't, and it was very important. Um, and I look at things like cloud computing and a lot of the work that we did, we looked at you know, how to do, uh, you know, speeding up the software development that would be taking and pouring gas on things that we were doing that would create uh, programs like Kessel Run to have software factories within, uh, within defense. All of that work, I just look at it and I think it was kind of foundational. And I go back to your question that I've been talking a little bit here, is looking at it from the other side, I think that we've actually made some pretty great progress. We've actually done a lot. Um, it's just that there's still so much to do yeah. because where we were starting from and to be honest with you, Ash moved so much forward, but we were still starting from way far behind. And so looking at where we are right now, we have to spend a lot of time uh, creating an awareness of where we actually are, yeah. removing the magic out of things that Craig was talking about, which is really are we looking at artificial intelligence or are we actually just looking at a better way to visualize and understand data? Are we looking at people and how to bring incredible people into this ecosystem? Um, and, it, and in some ways it's been disappointing um, because I think that when we look at it, software, which is sort of a cornerstone of, of where we think of defense and the future of combat and conflict, um, is still sort of misunderstood compared to 
I think of the big heavy piece of metal sitting on a runway. Those are still important, but they're ultimately gonna be powered, connected, and uh, given advantage against an adversary by software. And I don't think that the department's really rationalized that just yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, how about for you? You've been on this journey 20 years, uh, uh, almost 20, so 18, 18. <laughs> for you. Yeah. Um, what does this arc look like? And what, like, give us a sort of a little bit of a, uh, your view over that arc looking from the outside. Yeah, so I think I would say, um, kind of to Chris's point, I think we, we I think the department has come a very long way. Um, I, I think there's a whole, 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 whole lot further to go. Um, and some of it comes down to that very basic thing. And I mean, um, how many people in the audience have an iPhone or a phone they like? You all have a phone you like, I hope. When the next version comes out, do you get excited to get one and see what the new features are? Maybe, mm. Craig doesn't. I still, I still have a 12. All right, all right. Is it a mini or is it a? No, no, all right. that's a big one. There's still a 12. Um, but, but look, there is this thing about hardware that is very appealing. You can see it, you can feel it, you can touch it. Sometimes it's blinking lights, yay. Um, with software, you know, how many times a day does Gmail get better? Probably a whole lot. And in really subtle ways that over time make our lives better, right? Um, if you remember when Gmail started first, Autocorrecting, or not even autocorrecting, starting to write your sentences for you. Like, yeah, a little creepy, but kind of, yeah, that's what I was going to say. And it's only gotten better and better. Mm -hmm. uh, and you see that in other product areas as well. And I think that when you look at that, you know, what are we doing every single day to take ground? When you think about hardware, well, I got to bend metal, I got, you know, there's a lot of work to do. When it comes to software, that's just the natural course of things. And I think that fundamental thing yet isn't fully understood, I think, through the department. And so there isn't necessarily an appreciation for that uh, at scale. And I think that you know, a lot of people today have spoken about how do you scale these things. That is the next concern. Um, I think uh, Secretary Kendall said it earlier, you know, there's a lot of money going into innovation. There's a lot of money to the left of the quote unquote valley of death, which isn't really a term I love because um, I don't think it's quite right. Um, but there isn't enough picking winners, killing losers, and scaling things yeah. to the warfighter. Um, and I think that that's something that I think the CDA is doing a ton of. I think you're seeing that all over. General Shaughnessy, when he was commander of North Northcom, you know, took that bet, said, look, this needs to work, and it needs to work all across America in order for us to actually do our part in confronting COVID, um, and made a number of bets to do so. And so I think that that scale function, there are pockets of excellence that are doing that. Um, but how you do that, how you do it in a way that isn't threatening to the fact that we still need high marks, right? If Ukraine teaches anything, you still need the really amazing advanced weapon systems. You still need to be able to see everything from space. You need all those things. But to Chris's point, you also need excellent software that is getting better every single day, that is taking ground on behalf of the human every single day to give them every unfair advantage they deserve should they ever have to get to conflict. And that's the part that isn't yet fully, I think, understood by the department. Craig, uh, following on that, you know, you've been on the outside, you know, working at places like Lyft and LinkedIn, Dropbox, where you are that person who is pushing code and little updates. I think it was three times a day. At LinkedIn. Three times a day. When you left, it was three times yeah, a day. exactly. And and you're, you know, the product over a while. You know, sometimes you have to remind the user, like, hey, this is what it was like three months ago versus right. now. The same way I remember when I first uh, entered government. Colin Powell had uh, given and uh, put out an edict to the Department of State that said everyone should have their own computer. And I remember thinking, how did they do anything? <laughs> Wait, and, and it wasn't even talking about laptops. It was just yeah. desktops. The people were sharing desktops. You know, you come in a number of years later, and there's still there's no collaboration software. People are in a version of of document editing off in Microsoft Word where there's no collaboration. They've got, finally, they've got spell check. They have maybe some grammar checkers. And right. now you're looking at this, and our kids are working in Grammarly. They got chat GPT. They got all this other technology. And you're looking at the cap capabilities where people have all this, and you're tasked with a bunch of this. How, how, do, you, how do you get people on board of bringing in this tech? Well, now that you're telling me my job, I think I'm just going to go. <laughs> There's, there's a couple of things. First thing I, I would say is everyone on this panel has been a precursor for the work that I inherited, right? At General Shaughnessy, we haven't met yet, but the work you did in Northcom, uh, Guide is a huge part of CDAO now. Um, 
the work you did there to actually demonstrate with, with hockey. But can you, you explain what that is for? Sorry, oh, Jatsi to uh, uh, God. Oh, 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 sorry. Maybe I can't hear the mic as well. Uh, I said the work you did at Northcom um, for gu the guide experimentations, yep. um, which is a set of experimentations to think about how we can bring information together from across the globe to combatant commanders so they can make effective decisions. That started, I believe, under your watch, yeah. right? right? So, and, and also with Aki, you guys developed what it looks like to be digital first from a command and control perspective. And when we were out at Northcom, that's a, that's a large part of what's driving what we're doing. You're delivering value to the department uh, about uh, how to visualize, how to gather all that data together. And I don't know if you know this, but I inherited Chris's org, uh, the Defense Digital Service. Um, and- uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we, we had a spirited apology. conversation before we started. Um, and and, and they, they're, they're, there's a fascinating group of rebels that Chris built them to start on the outside of the department. Um, and, and our job now is to try to convince them that, to a large degree, to get to your question, that the rebels won, right? In, in a large degree, the rebels won, but you know, I've really liked this, the series, The Mandalorian, and what you notice is the rebels aren't very good at governing, right? <laughs> 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 when you're watching that series. And so um, we, 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 have to, we, have to, we have to take these, these pockets of excellence and, and bring them to bear um, at scale. So I don't actually feel like it's as far behind as I feared. What, what I think is um, we have to make that the, 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 the modern, what's now modern and working well, uh, just scale out a little bit more. I will tell you one thing though, we, we, in, in my organization at least, you're not allowed to send me a file attached to a, a, a file attached to an email, I send it back to you. You actually have to send me an Office 365 link. And that has remarkably changed the way they do business and the way they think about editing a document. Because when I first got there, they actually were doing that versioning thing, that really crazy labeling, you know, yeah. Chris version one, Aki version five, <laughs> passing it. You guys know this, right? Yeah. Back and back and forth. And we also have teams. So we have some things that have, have finally made it to the fore. But I actually think we have these pockets of, like, b based on the work that these guys here have done and, and others, we have these pockets of really great technology that's out, that's out in front. We've just got to figure out a way to smooth it out across the department. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Aki, um, Palantir for, for some time now has, you, you've offered these really powerful solutions to bring data together, for people to visualize it. What is that adoption, what, what is culturally allowed technology like that to be adopted when it is sometimes so foreign? Like, what can you tell us that has been the cultural the learnings to get the organization to tip culturally. Yeah, no, it's a great question. I think, I think at the end of the day, I think if you look at kind of where we started, which was you know that decidedly unsexy problem of data integration. Like, I mean, who wakes up every morning and says, "Let me go integrate some data"? Uh, very, very few people. I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah. I think this panel might one. be the panel for right. you. Buddy. <laughs> In the audience now. Um, you know, and recognizing that there was an opportunity there to say, hey, at the end of the day, you know, originally with the problem statement we started the company with, which was around, like, how do you enable intelligence analysts to have confidence in what the systems are giving them to enable the computer to do what it's great at, which is sifting through lots of data really quickly, but allowing the human to actually drive through intuition and through their analytic insights what the computer was doing. Um, solving that problem required doing lots of things like building visualization, building an ontology, building a data model, things like that. But what it required on the government side was pain, right? We had no choice. Analysts could not keep up with the volume of information and data that was coming through. And I think that what has for Palantir been really the thing that has fueled a lot of that cultural change or what we've seen change in the department is you know, urgency and importance, right? Where there's a critical problem, you know, the yeah. Afghan Neo, there's a critical problem. How do we do this? and turn on a 72 hour dime and, and effectively have, you know, somewhat of an orderly exit that's also tries to manage security and a number of other things. At some point, these problems just aren't human scale problems. They require systems, they require data, they require, again, every unfair advantage you can provide to that warfighter, operator, analyst to achieve their mission. And through that pain, there are pockets of excellence who said, look, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna use that program of record. It's, been sitting here for five years. It literally sits in the corner. 
I'm going to refuse to use it. And I'm actually going to speak up and, you know, I'm going to say, I understand I'm not an acquisition special. I'm also not a requirements professional. And we've kind of talked about that uh, in other parts of the day. But I am a person who understands what I need to achieve my mission. I'm going to demand better of my department. And I think what the department has done and what Dr. Carter did was say, hey, we are going to do that. And we are going to meet you and we are going to break through the barriers and we're going to let the rebels have a win and then fail at governing. Just kidding. Um, but, you know, effectively, we're, we're going to enable um, this technology to move faster. And I think one of the most interesting points we're at right now, um, which is around LLMs, which have some great pros and a, a whole and lot, a lot of, of potential cons, cons, potential <laughs> cons. But I think the interesting challenge I would put out there to everybody in this room and to every leader or somebody who's doing a training or an exercise is, how are you thinking about data? How are you thinking about AI? And how are you working that into something you're doing every single day? And with LLMs, do, does the department have an opportunity to not sit on the sidelines for the next 20 years? And I think the department absolutely has an opportunity to engage. This is not the Silicon Valley of 10 years ago where Silicon Valley didn't want anything to do with defense. Watching Ukraine, everybody in the Valley, not to speak for everybody, let's just start the vast majority of people understand the importance of the defense mission. And hey, even, even if there are some that don't, there are a whole lot that do and want to help with this. So how do we actually embrace this moment and say, look, here's a technology that we got to figure out, minimally to understand how the adversary is going to use it, maximally to increase our own unfair advantage and move forward. And I think that that is the opportunity in front of us. And if, if we get this right, then it's not 20 years on the sideline. Um, waiting for commercial to kind of way, 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 way out surpass capability that your warfighter has on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm really excited about that. And I think that, if I see that, then I'll know DOD's there. Chris, uh, sticking on this, I'm gonna keep going on this theme of culture. If you think about this from the, that you were trying to get these rebellions into the, into the institution, get them to create a little bit of chaos, sometimes a lot of chaos, uh, um, but trying to get people to see culture in a different way, what does it take, what is the culture elements that technologists on the outside need to understand to be effective to help the mission? Hmm. A few things come to mind. Um, I think that as we're looking at how we bring people into broadly what I think everybody here would say is defense packer uh, into this space, I think that it's important to realize that not everybody understands this mission in the way that we do. And I agree with Aki that most people, or at least when I, when I talk to most people who, who really don't know this space, they're probably going to be compelled by how important it is. But I don't think that they probably understand in the way that most of this room understands what it means and what is at stake and why the consequences are so important. They, they, you, you just don't understand. And, and when, I when I sort of tell the story and I try to get somebody to come into this, um, I, I say that it, most of my life is this very circuitous path of learning the definition of the word mission, which is a really important thing that I learned, but I don't think I actually understood because I didn't come from government, I didn't come from military background. I'm a late stage visitor into the mission of defense and national security. And so I spent a lot of time talking about that, but there are a couple of other things that I think are important. We just have to realize that we want the best and brightest people in this country to come and work and build systems for problems of impact. I think the Ash talked about that a lot, right? But we also have to realize that most of these people, and myself, uh, Craig just also recently went through this, like we'll show up and we won't have a clearance at that moment. We'll have to go through that process. We won't actually understand that why does it take so long? And actually that impatience is probably the superpower if we actually put it in a right place where people can do amazing things. And so if you think of, you know, when we talk about commercial software companies and we talk about bringing in great talent, what are we really saying? We want people who are best in their field to come deliver results faster than ever before, right? 
that's kind of a, there, there's two parts to that equation though. One is we need to convince those people that they can show up. We need to let them show up, <laughs> knowing that they want to work on actual mission-facing problems. They need to be able to get clearances. They need to be able to go in and jump into real work. But somebody on the other side, and I think that this is actually, I'll just bring it back to Ash for a moment. Somebody on the other side is going to have the courage and the tenacity to allow that. And it is actually probably the hardest thing is matching those two elements together. That's the spark. And so when I talk to people that we're bringing in and we're bringing people into rebellion, there's a few things that I always say. Know that it means so much. It's going to be harder than you think. It's going to take longer than you thought. You have to play this long game. But when it happens, when you do something, you'll change somebody's life forever. And I can't think of anything else where you get to go do that. So I think we have to be honest about that. I try to be. I think we have to, on the other side of the equation here, from the people who are inside the building, give people, give those, these, these individuals who are coming in from industry, who are coming in from outside of defense, give them a place that they can run. Give them a place that they can try. Because if you do, I think that that's pretty incredible. I think that we're sitting in this room, actually, quite honestly, on this panel mm -hmm. because of that. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and I think we just have to be honest, right? It's going to be harder than you thought. Yeah. So have the tenacity. Tenacity is a great way. Uh, General, you've res been responsible for so many of our finest serving uh, on the front lines. How do you think about culture for those organizations, those people to understand what capabilities are out there that they, if we brought it into them, and we figured out how to culturally mind meld more quickly, we could adopt these technologies. Yeah, I think on, on the culture side, I don't know that SpaceX and the government could be any different culturally in many aspects, but in many ways, it's identical. <laughs> Compared to you and sitting next to Chris oh, Lynch. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but then it's also from the, the one thing that is similar is the passion, right? The passion on the SpaceX side, they're part of something bigger than themselves. What they're doing every day is for purpose. Um, when you look at our government workers, what they do every day matters, and they understand that, so they're passionate about what they do. But what is vastly different is on the SpaceX side, SpaceXers question everything. They, request, they question every requirement. Even Elon says, even if it came from me, question it. We don't do that on the government side. Yeah. We need to start doing that because that's what bridles us from finding what's in the realm of the possible out there because we just think we have to go iterative. And I really worry that if we just keep doing iterative approaches, we make a bunch of small bets, even if we're widely successful in those, we will not maintain our competitive advantage based on the pace of innovation of our peer adversaries. So stay on that for a second, because you know, in the military system, in the promotion system, right. sometimes it's hard to take big bets. How do we get that cultural big bet, making those big bets on technology? Right, I think, I think one just, I think it's opening our eyes to what's happening in the commercial world. And again, I think SpaceX is a great example. There's many others out there. Um, I think doing some really introspective study of, okay, what are we doing and what could we actually leverage from the commercial world? And then I think trying to determine where is the risk that we can take such that we can take a few big bets. And my premise is that if you took a couple big bets, you'd be better off, even if half of them fail, than if you just took a bunch of small bets and they all succeed. And I think bringing the, the culture of the individuals, whether it's guys w working in the DOD by rewarding them for being innovative, by putting them in positions where they have more responsibility because they were able to take risk, being able to accept failure, which is a whole other uh, bunny trail to go down. But I think at SpaceX, we realize that, that failure is part of innovation mm -hmm. and you have to be able to accept that. The last launch from SpaceX was a wild success by any measure of merit from SpaceX, but I keep getting a bunch of notes from folks saying, well, sorry about the launch. It was a wildly successful. We are advancing our technology at a, a speed of innovation that requires us to take those risks. We do it safely, but nonetheless, we take risks. I think that culture within the DoD has to be more ingrained and it starts at the leadership and it has to go all the way down. And I think from an acquisition standpoint, I think we have to take risk 
and some big bets that will take that revolutionary capability that our warfighters need. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we're almost out of time. Just no more than 20 seconds each. What, if you had your magic wand and could wave it, that would massively accelerate technology adoption, keeping us uh, maximally competitive at, for the DOD international security apparatus. What would it be? And we'll just come down straight down the line. Uh, agile development across the department. Eat your vegetables. Eat your vegetables. We just, we, <laughs> our greatest enemy of innovation That's right now than mine. is ourselves. If we just eat our vegetables, do the hard thing, take advantage of the acquisition, uh, 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 authorities Congress has given DOD and then pick winners, good things will happen. Uh, get in the habit of shipping software multiple times every single day out yeah. to a warfighter. Very tasty You'll just change vegetables. the world. Tasty vegetables. Tasty, tasty <laughs> vegetables. Yeah. And I would say take some big bets. Um, take some big bets that are thought out that you can iterate yourself through in that big bet to what the warfighters need. Uh, that will allow us to continue to develop in an, almost a DevOps environment that will just allow you to iterate your, well, your way to what the warfighters need. I think that, that ability to take those big bets and the acquisition process that would allow that to happen, I don't think we need a magic wand. I think we just need to do it. Absolutely. Well, uh, I want to thank uh, SCSP for hosting us, bringing us all together. Uh, please thank our panelists, and we'll continue on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.